Good evening. It is Monday. It is hashtag the best week ever. Hey Stephanie, how are you doing? So we are going to, in like fashion, as we always do. Hey Sarita, Rita, Rita. Oh, Keisha, hey DJ, how are you doing? Rosie Posey in the building, looking like money on the smoke. Take it, take it, take it. How are you doing? Hey man, I pray you guys had a good day today. Hey, Mr. Cannon, how are you doing? How are you doing? I pray you guys are having an amazing. Hey, India, India, congrats, congrats on the new position. Yes, yes, hallelujah. So get your pen, your paper. Hey, Lakeisha, and your Bible. Um, hey, Jazzy, Jazzy Fizzle in the building. Um, get your pen, your paper, and your Bible. We're going to. Hey, Pinky, how are you doing, sister? This is for you. I pray that you would be on. Hallelujah. Thank you for letting me get in your guts a little bit earlier. I only did it because I love you. I only did it because I love you. Um, and I mean that. Amen. Hey, Tanisha, how are you doing? Chastity's in the building. Yes, India, we celebrate your new position, not just in the natural, but in the spirit. There's been so much. You've just changed leaps and bounds. Doctor, doctor, I love you. I cannot wait to see you again. Cannot wait to see you again. Hey, La hey, Lakita, how are you doing? We love you. We love you, Lakita. We love you. Even though you're quiet, we love you. <coughs> hey, Michelle, how are you doing? So get your pen, your paper, and your Bible. We're going to be in two particular scriptures that we're going to read. Um, hey, Jamie, how are you doing, sis? Hey, David, how are you? I love you. Chandra in the building. Sister Chandra. Sister Chandra. Um, get your pen, your paper, and your Bible. I don't know how many times I'm going to say that. Um, I don't want to keep you guys on um, long. There's a lot. It's loaded. It's a loaded word today. Loaded, hey cakes, bike, Kendra, Alan. It's loaded. It's loaded. God is amazing, and this is so good. Listen, listen. Can't wait to see you in Houston, Mama. Listen. Let me know. So, um, we're gonna be in Matthew eight and Mark nine. Hey, Kia, Kia, how are you doing? We're gonna be in Matthew eight. Mark 9, only because I feel like a word of wisdom, a word of knowledge has a foundation that must be steeped in the principles of his nature, which is the word. <laughs> I'm excited. Okay, so we're going to get started. I'm going to pray. We're going to be, um, thank you, man of God. We're going to be hopping all over a little bit because I don't know how the Holy Spirit is going to string all this together because it's a lot. It's a lot. So we're going to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for securing this room. We thank you, Father, for what you shall do tonight. We thank you for what you shall speak tonight. We bless you, King of kings, Lord of lords, that it's your voice that we are chasing after. It's your voice that we have come for. It's your presence that we are chasing after. And so, King of glory, would you overtake the room? King of glory, would you have your way tonight? King of glory, would you pour out healing and wholeness and deliverance? King of glory, would you allow us to perceive you past our intellect? Would you allow us to engage with you past our intellect? Would you allow us to cross over, hallelujah, into the depths of your presence and your spirit tonight in the name of Jesus? And so, Father, we forget those things which are behind us. We forget what the day held. We forget what we beheld in the day hallelujah. We forget about what ha we have to do after this. We sit in your presence, all of us. And so we're asking for a corporate moment in the corporate anointing. We're asking God, may we have all things in common tonight. We're asking father, would you overturn some things? Would you turn over some things after you overturn it? Then would you turn it over for us? God, we're asking you, may our perception be shook. Hallelujah. And then when we come out, may our minds be renewed in the precious word of the Lord. Hallelujah. And so, Father, this is all about you. King of glory, this is all about you. Lord of hosts, this is all about you. Nothing, no one gets the glory but you. And so you've set us up as we set in your presence. In Jesus' name, hallelujah, 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 in Jesus' name. 
All right. I am hot. I don't know why I'm hot, but anyway, who cares? Um, we're going to talk about disbelief and unbelief. We're going to talk about disbelief and unbelief. And we're going to have an honest conversation about where we are. An honest conversation. The Lord gave me this picture. And so some of the graphics you see, it's me making sense of the word of the Lord. It's me trying to um, make this thing set with me because he's, he's showing me. And, and so I, I saw this picture and I saw, you know, the old back in the day where there were two water fountains um, where there will be a sign and the sign would say for coloreds only in the times of segregation. The father says that there are some of us who are dealing with spiritual segregation. You go through the back door because that's your door. You go through the back door because you've always gone through the back door. And so even when you pray, you pray back door prayers because you don't feel like you don't believe and you've never dealt with God bringing you through the front door. Jesus. Jesus. We are going to deal with some stuff tonight and I want you to be honest because that's what the Holy Spirit works with. He works with honesty and he'll do the rest. If you're honest, he'll do the rest. He'll do the rest. He'll do the rest. Hold on a second. Alexa, Luke, the song. Whatever. Right? And so he, he showed me these two water fountains. I could just see them. It's as clear as day. And he said, this spiritual segregation, he says, it's not brought on. There is no separation. There is no segregation. But he said, did you get louder? I, didn't say, I said, loop the song. I didn't say good. Anyway, and he said, that segregation is as a mind, as a man thinketh. And so he says, I'm going to deal with this a little bit later, and if I don't, I want you to come back to it because I want to give you the word for it. But it's found in the scripture. It's found in Matthew chapter 8. No, it's found in Mark chapter 9. It's found in Mark chapter 9. So we're going to talk, with it, talk about it. In the world, they say those who can do, right? If you think you can, you will. I want you to write that, say, I want you to write that statement down. If I think, if I believe I can, I want you to write can in big letters because... It's a principle. And so even in Mark chapter 9, we see an outsider using a kingdom principle. It works for him. It works for him. Right? And so when we understand this, well, hey, man of God, this, this can principle, C-A-N, is a principle. Jesus. I'm getting ahead of myself. It's a principle. And so when we understand, when we believe can, it begins to work. It begins to do. It begins to become a workman in our lives. And so... I'm going to give you the definitions, and you can just look them up. All I did was look them up. All I did was Google them. Belief or unbelief and disbelief. Sometimes we use those words interchangeably, right? Sometimes, but they're very different in kingdom nature. We're not talking about the nature of Google. That's cute. But we're talking about the kingdom nature. There's a very big difference between disbelief and unbelief. Big difference. The definition for disbelief is unpreparedness, unwillingness, or inability. The inability to believe. Disbelief is unpreparedness, unwillingness, and the inability to believe. Unbelief is rejection. Unbelief means you're prepared. Unbelief means, again, you're not willing. Unbelief, the biggest one, means you have the ability and you chose. Your perception is going to be your reality. Period, point blank. Your reality is your perception. No matter how good God is, no matter how, perf how perfect he is, no matter how wonderful he is, your perception is going to be your reality. 
And so there's plenty of intercessors, there's plenty of pastors, there's plenty of preachers, there's, there's plenty of people who do great kingdom things because they see it, they see the role of father very different. Let me explain this to you. And I'm going to tell you my story, how this even came to be. So it's kind of like a child, one of my son's friends comes over here. I am my son's mother. And my, my son's friend has a mother. My son's friend hurts himself while he's over here. But because he doesn't see me, and he doesn't see the role as mother as being universal, he doesn't ask me to help him. He doesn't ask me to take care of him. Even though I have, I can, I've got the band-aids, I've got the peroxide, I've got the desire, all of that. And so sometimes we can see Father, we can see God for somebody else in another role, but we can only see God as our perception from our past allows us. What does that mean? If you listen to your testimony about God and all it's ever about is how he brought you out and he's never brought you in, then you can pray that God will bring them in. You can decree that God will bring them in. You'll prophesy to them that God will bring them in, but then you will go home and you will pray, God, bring me out. God, get me out. God, take me out. Out, out, out. But for them, you see them in. You see them walking in. You see them working in. And all you ever do is come out. So I see God as the deliverer. And they see God as the sustainer, sustainability, the provider. Listen, when we talk about every parent in here and everybody who's been parented, right? Very... Uh, the percentage of how we see the deliverer in the family, the deliverer rather in the parent, is such a small percentage in terms of how we see the parent as just being loving, as just being the one who provides, the one who loves me so much that they give me what I can't even articulate. Your kids cannot even articulate what you really do. And so when they say, I love you, it is so big. It is so crazy. It is so magnanimous because they can't even, they can't even articulate what you do in them and for them and with them. And so some of us, have only been rolling with God and we only mess with him and deal with him and talk about him in the terms of always bringing us out. And so when you listen to how you tell your story, when you listen to the, the verbiage that you use about God, is it just God as being your deliverer? And then you wonder why you're always going through cycles and you're always going around the mountain and you never go into the land. It's because you don't see God as the one who can bring you in. You will not get into without the hand of God. But if you only see God as the one who's going to bring you out, then that's what you're constantly going to be asking him. Get me out. Bring me out. Do this thing. This makes sense. Because you, you're only going to get from God how you see him. You're only going to ask of him how you see him. And how you see him is embedded in your life. Here's the thing. Here's the thing. We romanticize up and we romanticize down our past. That's why when you break up with somebody, you remember all the good times and you think about going back with the children of Israel. They romanticize slavery. Why did you lead us out here where there are no graves? We could have died in Israel. You romanticizing being in slavery, boo-boo. You hated it. The Bible says that a cry arose out of Egypt and so God sent Moses because y'all were crying. Now all of a sudden you got out here and you tripping. You're romanticizing your experience. And so a lot of times we do that only when we remember how God brought us out, we, we romanticize it down. We, we still see the loss. We, we don't see him as bringing us in. When, when their exodus was happening, a small percentage of it was about Egypt. 20% was about Egypt. 10% was about Egypt. 
The 90% about was, was about where they were going. 10% of your story is where you're coming out. 10% of your dealings with God is him bringing you out. The other 90% is what's before you, what's ahead of you. The word of the Lord that's over your life. I pray this is making sense. And so, I'm just going to be honest. I'm just going to give you how my story, and I'm going to give you pieces of my story, and I'm going to give you pieces of sometimes that's why we have to be so honest with God. We've got to be so honest with the Father. So, um, when I was, I've been on my own since I was like 16. Okay. So I've been on my own since I was like 16 and you know, crazy foundation, all that good stuff. Everybody has a story. Everybody has a story and everybody has to choose which way their story is going to go. Even when we get to the place of being an old head in kingdom things, everybody has a story. Everybody has a story. So I was 16 years old when I moved out. So I did a lot of dumb stuff because I didn't have a lot of wisdom. I just didn't have a lot. Of, I'm just being honest. I didn't have a lot of wisdom. I didn't have a lot of resources. I didn't. I wasn't able to fall back on people. So I was. I was. I was hustling. I was robbing Peter to pay Paul, and then I would rob Paul to pay Mark, and then I would break Mark's kneecaps, and you know what I'm so I could keep my money. You know what I mean? So I was all over the place, and so. Um, when I started walking back with God, y'all know I got saved at seven, but when I started walking back with God, <laughs> um, I was still managing clubs. I was managing clubs. That's, that's some of my background. I used to be a manager at some clubs. And so I started walking back with God and I was still um, managing clubs. Is this in the prayer room? Are we in the prayer room, guys? Or am I, am I on my page or are we in the prayer room? Hey, sister. Am I tripping? Am, are we in the prayer room, guys? I need somebody to answer me. Anyway, so, um, so that, you know, that's part of my story. So when I started walking back with God, um, I, I lived in, I lived in this place. I lived in my apartment and in my coat closet, in my coat closet, I had boxes. I'm on my page. I'm not in the prayer room. I'm in the prayer room or am I in the, on my page? Cause now I got two different answers. Y'all are being prophetic. Um, I need somebody to text me, please. Am I on my page? I thought I was in the prayer room. Am I on my page or am I in the prayer room? Because if not, I'm going to go into the prayer room. I'm on my page. Thank you, Chastity. Okay, I'm going to get off and I'm going inside the prayer room. I'm not supposed to be out here. I'm supposed to be in the prayer room. Okay, guys, my bad. I'm going to get off and I'm going to. Am I in the prayer room, Tanya? Are you sure? Because Chastity said I'm not. I'm sorry, guys. I know you guys are like, what are y'all doing? I'm supposed to be in the prayer room. I'm not supposed to be on my page. Oh, crap. We're here. We'll stay. I don't know where we are. Praise the Lord. Anyway, it's not supposed to be on my page. We're supposed to be in the prayer room. Thank you, Sabria. Thank you, Chastity. Um, thank you, Lakeisha. Okay, so anyway, I would have... Um, yeah, this is so confusing. So I would have um, empty boxes that were in my coat closet. And so every, like, at the end of the month, I would pull the, the boxes out. Well, we're just going to say it's okay. Thank you, guys. Um, I would pull the boxes out because I thought this was going to, to be the month that I'm going to get evicted. This is going to be it. And so like clockwork on the same day of every month, I would pull the boxes out. I would pull, it was a cycle. And so what, what happened during this time in my life is I realized that I was dealing with, yeah, guys, thank you. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. I was going to get off and get back on. It's fine. It's in the prayer wall. Y'all know I really don't go live on my page, so this must be the Holy Spirit because I don't do that. Anywho, so fast forward, fast forward to maybe a couple months ago. It's just, I know, maybe a couple months ago. I was asking God about certain questions about what's going on and where we are and what things are and blah, 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 blah. And the Holy Spirit took me back to that point where I had the cardboard boxes in the coat closet, closet. And he said, you're still doing it. He said, you're still doing it. He said, you don't see me as the person. You don't see me as the one that's not just your deliverer. You're not dealing with me. I'm just, gonna, I'm just, being, I'm just being honest because here's the thing. I'm not going to sit up here and act like it is all good and I'm a holy roller and I have obtained and I'm sitting next to Jesus. <laughs> Absolutely not. Praise the Lord. So he said, you're still, you're still dealing with this. He said, this, is, this thing is still playing in the background. This, this, not the issue or the time, 
but how you see me as the one who constantly brought you out of that over and over and over, even though you were making dumb decisions because you're romanticizing it downward. It was, that was a time frame where you were getting wisdom. It was a time frame where I was bringing you out of uh, being in those clubs. I was bringing you into, I was, there was a bunch of stuff that you had to stop doing, but that was sheer wisdom that you did not stop doing, right? But he's saying now, now that you're not doing those things, you're still looking at me and dealing with me out of an old perception. And so you're only going to get and engage. And so sometimes, this is for some people on here, sometimes you're, you're, you're thinking, okay, God, if you pray this prayer, when is it going to happen for me? When is the manifestation going to happen for me? I'm praying for people. I, I prayed for her and it happened for her. I prayed for them and it happened for them. And the Lord is saying, I'm not going to move this thing because I'm pressing on your perception. I'm pressing on your perception. I need you to come out of this place of how you view me and how you deal with me if we're ever going to get from here to there. If we're ever going to move from here to there. This is making sense. So I forget who I was talking to today and I was kind of talking about this thing a little bit. We're, we're on my page and it is what it is and so we're just going to go all in. So um, I came from, you know, I, I talk about it a little bit. I came from a crazy little background and um, my dad was a preacher and my mom uh, used to beat on us and um, so I remember as a little girl like starting like seven or eight or whatever I would go into the room that she was in and I would stand there and in my mind I would say this is going to be the day that she turns around and she says oh my gosh I love you oh my gosh you're the best and it never happened it never happened and so I would set myself up, I would set myself up, I would set myself up because of my thinking, my thinking. And so I remember fast forward to maybe when I was like 30. So I was seven years old. Now I'm 30. I remember one time I was in the place of prayer and the father said to me, he said, you do you do that to me? You do that to me. You tiptoe around me. You tiptoe around me waiting for my approval. And here's the thing, you do it with people too. He says, you stand in the doorway waiting for them to turn around and to pat you on the head and say that I'm glad you're here. And he was like, sweetie, it's never going to come from the place that you want it to come from. It's never going to come from the place that it's going to come from. And the greater question is, why did you ever think it was supposed to come from that place? Because that's not necessarily biblical. When we talk about, you know, when I deal with young people, I deal with people who have family, you know, parent parental issues. What do you do when the deliverer when the deliverer comes through, the one who needs to be delivered, what do you do? What do you do when the deliverer comes through, the one who needs to be delivered? So they deliver their deliverer. But we live in a construct where the deliverer is looking to the one who needs to be delivered. And they're saying, listen, reject me, reject me. Okay, abandon, abandon. And the father said, no, 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 I've covered, come here, Joseph. Come here, Joseph. The deliverer was the one who was put in the pit. The deliverer was the one who was in part of the deliverer for the ones who need to be delivered. And so it was by the hands of the one who needed to be delivered that they put their deliverer on a path so that they could be delivered. And so, you know, where we are, where we are, y'all have to listen, y'all have to hear this. We got to be honest with where we are. We have to be honest. Do Disbelief and unbelief is one thing. It's, it's, it's two totally different things. Unbelief, unbelief is evil. Unbelief is really a dart. Unbelief is coming to chip away and for you to believe the lies about God. Listen, if I want you to write this down and I want you to speak this over yourself for seven days. Longer if you want to, but I want this to get ingrained into your DNA for at least seven days. I want you to say that the character of God must be on display in my life. Your life should speak the character and the nature of God. Your life, and so we're struggling. Many of us are struggling, and we're like, God, what you said, God, your word said, God, your word said, and we don't understand that the Father is saying to us, your, your life preaches me. Your life is a testimony to, of my books. Your life on the walls of your life are written the words of who I am. People should look at your life, and they should believe that there is God without you opening your mouth. 
the character of God. And so that's why the enemy fights against your mind so much. That's why he's fighting against your perception. Your perception is in your mind. So that why? So that you would believe that God is holding something back from you. And God is saying, no, actually, you're holding yourself back from me because of belief. Go to Matthew chapter 8. Go to Matthew chapter 8. Do I want to do Matthew chapter 8? No, go to Mark chapter 9. We'll just start there. Go to Mark chapter 9. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. I want you to see this. And then we'll go to Matthew chapter 8. This summer has been a summer of identity on the prayer wall, which we're not on, and Periscope. And it's not our identity, but it's his identity. And you've got to break your mind. You've got to break your mind so that the mind of Jesus can push through. And the truth is, is that God wants to give it to you more than you want it. God wants you walking in it more than you want it. Yes, you had to go through a process. Yes, you had to go through a breaking. Yes, you had to go through a question. But, it, but even that was a controlled environment. It was a controlled space. It was a controlled place so that you could meet with him. But you weren't supposed to stay stuck there. And your relationship with him was not supposed to stay stuck there. He, you should know God in the totality of every season that you've been in. But we stay in this one season. We stay in this one season in our mind. And so that's why you can get out of Egypt and you can get stuck in the wilderness and you can die there. Because in your mind, you're going around the same mountain. In your mind, you're going around the same mountain. In your heart, you're going around the same mountain. In your identity, you're going around the same mountain. But you can see the promise, but you're going in circles. You're not there anymore, but you're dealing with you're dealing with yourself. You're dealing with everything as if you're there. We're in Mark chapter 9. <clears throat> I want you to go down to... I want you to go down to... Verse 18. We're going to go to verse 18. I'm just going to give context to the scripture. And wheresoever... He, this is the, the father talking about his son. His son has a demon. He says, wheresoever he taketh in the demon, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth his teeth, and pineth away. And I spoke to your disciples and they, that they should cast him out, and they could not. And he answered, he said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer with you? Bring him to me. And they brought him unto him, and he said, straightway to the spirit, um, straightway to you, yeah, straightway to the spirit, uh, tear him. And he fell on the ground and wallowed foaming. He said to the father, how long is it ago since how long has this been going on? And he said, of a child. And oftentimes it's cast him into the fire. It's cast him into the waters to destroy him. But I need you to circle this if you're with me. I never noticed this before until today. He says, verse 22, the father speaking to Jesus. He says, oftentimes it is cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if you can do anything. Have compassion on us and help us. Let me just circle that if you can. Go to verse 23. Notice what Jesus said. Jesus said unto him, if you can. So the man says to him, he says, if you can. And then Jesus looks at him and says, if you can. And he's like, I said. So the man says to Jesus, he says, Jesus, if you can. And Jesus looks at him and he says, if you can. If you can believe. All things are possible. All things are possible. All things are possible to him who can believe. Let's look at this word can. This word can, this word can in Young's, I just got a text message, sorry guys. In Young's literal, or, or not, in Strong's, it, it's 1410. It's 1410 in Greek, 1410. And it's the word Duname, duname, duname. This is where we get our word dunamus and dynamite. The word can is a derivative. It is a root of dunamus and dynamite. The word can means to be able. And it means to have power.
It means capable and it means strong and powerful. And so the, the man, he looks at Jesus and he says, if you're able, if you're capable, if you have the power. And Jesus looks at him and he says, if you can, if you have the power. And straight away the father of the child cried out with tears and said, Lord, I believe. Help my rejection. Help the times before I even took them to the disciples and they couldn't cast out the demon. When I saw the child being cast into the fire and I looked over at my neighbor's house and they were sitting at the table with their child. Help me the time that my son was, was being thrown on the ground by this entity and was rolling around and foaming at the mouth and I, I looked to, over at my neighbor's house and I saw them sitting with their daughter. Help my rejection. Help the pain. Because I've had to live with this and I've blamed you for it secretly because I see that you can make perfect children and I don't understand why my child my child just doesn't have something where he's mute or my child just doesn't have a learning disability. My child is the town demoniac. All I want to do is hold my child. All I want to do is rear my child. All I want to do is pour into my child. God, help my rebellion. Help my rejection because I've lived this. Help my rejection because I've come through this. Help my rejection because my story is different. And it's because I've seen everybody else's story. So God, I know that you're able, but my issue is, I don't understand why you even gave me this issue. I don't understand why you didn't let me have it and you let my kid. Help my unbelief. Help my memories. Because I got to a point where I just stopped believing that you were gonna do it for me. I got to a point where I figured I would just take what I could get. I took the child to the disciples and they couldn't cast out the demon. So you're my last ditch effort, so you're here if you can. If you can. And so you notice what Jesus dealt with. Jesus didn't deal with, oh, this is so hard for me. Oh, this is something I've never seen before. Oh, this is the first demon that he dealt with dad. He dealt with dad. He said, if you can, you, if, if you decide, because unbelief is a decision. It is a decision. Either I'm going to, uh, belief is I have bought into. I am convinced. Unbelief is I've decided this is not true. I've decided this is not for me. I've decided. I've consciously made an educated decision. This isn't for me. Unbelief. So you see what Jesus dealt with? Jesus dealt with the man. Before he could get to the child, he, the dude was standing in the way. The unbelief was standing in the way. And so Jesus was saying to him, listen, I don't have to heal your unbelief. I don't have to even help your unbelief. I just need you to make a decision. I need you to see when you were looking at your neighbor sitting at the, sitting at the table with their son. I need you to, I need you to, I put that picture there because you, for you to know I'm able. When, when you saw your neighbor with their daughter walking down the street and he, your dad, her dad was teaching her a craft. I put them before you because this moment was going to happen. This ain't about your son. This is about you. It's about you. And so he says, he says, Jesus, if you can, how many of us have said that in Jesus, if you're able, Jesus, when you, Jesus, 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 we're asking all these things in prayer and Jesus is doing to us the same thing he did to this man. He says, well, if you can believe, if you can believe, notice what he said, notice what he said. And when Jesus saw the people come running together, in verse 25, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying to him, death and dumb spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter into him no more. And the spirit cried and rent him sore, came out of him, and he was one as he was dead, and he wasn't dead. I'm paraphrasing verse 27. Jesus took him up by the hand and lifted him, and he arose. And when he came into the house, the disciples asked him privately, why couldn't we cast him out? He said, this thing comes out by prayer and fasting. By prayer and fasting. That thing was, the issue itself was not a challenge. The challenge was the unbelief. The challenge was the, the challenge in your life is not the issue. It's not the issue that you're, it's not the issue that you keep laboring over. It's not the issue that you keep seeing. The issue is your perception. 
The issue is your perception of your past. The, is the issue is you keep looking at your memory and you're judging. Has God discriminated against me? Does God, I've always gone through the back door, so I figure that's just where I'm supposed to go. I'm, I belong in the back door. I just, I belong in the back door. And so when things are going your way and you're praying these back door prayers and God's not answering them because he's saying, I'm going to lead you through the front door because you're the head and not the tail. You're above only and not beneath. And you don't understand that when I led you through the back door before, I was only leading you that way because it wasn't a back door. It was a secret door. And so what you were thinking, how I got you out by the skin of your teeth, you don't understand it was perfect timing. You don't understand that I was leading you by the way and I was handing you off to somebody that I was causing to pray for you and they prayed for you in the secret place and that's how you, get, you got here. We don't have all of the detail, but we've been judging him and we've been judging ourselves by what we've gone through and, and we don't even understand that the pit was so purposed. Because it was one road to the palace, and you had to go this way. But he was there the whole time. Go to uh, Matthew chapter 8. Go to Matthew chapter 8. And I want you to see this. The centurion. Matthew chapter 9. I told a tale. Matthew chapter 9. Let me know when you get there. Let me know when you get there. I pray that this is, this is helping you. I pray that this is helping you. Matthew chapter 8, I lied. Matthew chapter 8. I, I did the morning snippet on a piece of this, but that's not what we're going to talk about. I want you to see this. I'm going to start with verse 5. Verse 5. Matthew chapter 8, verse 5. Let me know when you get there. This is so amazing. The power of your belief. The power of your decision to believe again. The power of your decision that the character of God must be written on the walls of my life. That people must look in my life and they must meet with God. That my life speaks. Not just my testimony of how I was rock bottom and how my legs was off and my arms were short and he grew them. No, no, no. No, no, no. The goodness of God. The nature, all of the nature of God, not just 10%. The nature of God must be written upon the walls of your life. Who he is and what he says. And his character must be written upon the walls of your life. And so you have to choose to believe again. All right, verse 5. And Jesus entered Capernaum and came into and came into him a centurion beseeching him. And he said, Lord, my servant lieth at home sick of palsy, grievously tormented. And Jesus said unto him, I will come and I will heal him. Jesus come, Jesus come, Jesus come into my situation. Jesus come to my uh, bind and Jesus come. God loose you. Listen to what the centurion said. He answered and said, Lord, I am not worthy of that, that thou shalt come under my roof. He said, But speak. Your word only. Speak your word only. And my servant shall be healed. For I'm a man under authority, and I have soldiers under me. And I say to the servant, do this, and he doeth it. I don't know what's going on with my internet. And he doeth it. And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. He said unto them that follow, he said, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great a faith. No, not in Israel. Not to the people that I'm called to. Not to the people that I'm called to. I don't know what happened. Did my internet go out? My bad. Did my internet go out? I think it did. Did my internet go out, guys? Is my internet back on? <laughs> I have Comcast. That's all I need to say. I have Comcast. If somebody could say, Anish, you're back on, that would be great. You can see me? Okay, okay, you can see me. Okay, I'm sorry. I have Comcast. Boo. Okay. Let me wait a second. Let me wait a second. Okay, so we're in verse 9. We're still in verse 9. I'll read it again. All right, so he says, For I am a man under authority, having soldiers that are under me. And I say to this man, Go, and he goeth, and to another, Come, and he cometh. And to my servant, Do this, and he doeth it. 
And when Jesus heard it, he marveled. And he said unto them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And I'm in verse 11. And he said unto them, That many shall come from the east and the west, and shall sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the children of the kingdom shall be cast out in utter darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Verse 13. And Jesus said unto the centurion, Go your way. As you have believed, so be it unto you. And his servant was healed in the self same hour. So I want you to circle that. He said, go your way. And as thou hast believed, as you have believed, so be it unto you. What you believed, it is yours. What you believe, it is yours. But let's go back up to what Jesus says. We're going to go back. We're going to go backwards. Jesus marveled at them and he said, Verily I say, in verse 10, I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. No, not in Israel. He says, um, he talks about the, the kingdom and, and, and he's talking about, I'm, I'm here, I'm here. I'm here for Israel, but here it is, this outsider, he's understanding a principle. He's understanding a principle. What is this principle? So the centurion rolls up on Jesus and he says, listen, my servant is sick. Jesus says, okay, I will come. The centurion said, no, you don't have to come. If you would send your word and God said, let there be. So the centurion understood the nature of God. He's an outsider. He's an outsider. So the centurion, the nature of God is when he speaks, things happen. We don't need him to physically come in the house. All I need you to do is speak. Listen to what the centurion said. He said, listen, I'm a man of authority. I'm under authority. And then I have men who are under me. When I say to the men who are under me, you are under authority. You, it's gonna make me, it's gonna make me, it's gonna make me happy. You are under authority. And the centurion said, I have men who are under me. When I say to them, go, they go. When I say to them, do, they do. And so he said, if you would just send your word, it acts like a man. Woo! He said, if the nature of God, as I understand, it's as if that his word is people. It's as if his word is soldiers. Even though they're not physical soldiers, his word, come on, he's giving you a picture of what happens when God speaks. And so Jesus says, okay, I'll go, I'll go. This is an outsider. This is somebody who doesn't know the ways of God. This is somebody who doesn't believe necessarily. But God, he says, he says Jesus says, okay, I'll go. He says, no, no, no. No, no, no. God said, let there be. He said, let there be. And so when he said, let there be, whatever he was talking to about let there be, took legs, took arms, and moved into position. And so the centurion is saying, I understand that when God speaks, this is exactly what happens. Jesus, all you have to do is speak. Jesus, all you have to do is send your word. You don't physically have to go. And the Bible says Jesus marveled. He was like, I haven't seen anything like this in the place where people should be acting like this. I haven't. I, so here it is. We have somebody who's on the outside who is using a principle on the inside and it's working. It's working. He, here it is. An outsider is using a principle for the insiders. The insiders have it all. The insiders have the grace. The insiders have the principles. And the father is saying, you're not using it. And so an outsider comes along. Understand the ways of God. Remember, the character of God must be written on the walls of my life. The character of God must be written on the walls of my life. Are y'all seeing this? The character of God, the character of God. And so the, the centurion says, no, no, I know the character of God. <laughs> Hallelujah. And so when he's, when he's getting ready to walk away, Jesus says unto him, Jesus says, listen, be it unto you according to how you have believed. And the Bible says in the self-same hour, his servant 
was healed. The centurion believed that Jesus just blinked in his direction. The centurion believed that if Jesus just thought in the direction, that his servant would be immediately healed. And so, listen, that's why the Bible says explicitly, and his servant was healed in the self-same hour. And so I know many of us, we have prayed prayers. I believe in suddenly. I believe in the self-same hour. I believe in immediately. And then we get up and it doesn't happen. And the, and the Father is saying, be it unto you according to what you believe. Be it unto you according to the power of your can, the dunamis of your can, the explosiveness of your can. What do you believe about me? What do you believe about my key? What do you believe about my nature? It's coming through in the form of your answered prayers. I don't know. I got to get some people and I got to get my prayer through and I got to call some intercessors so I can get my prayer through. And the father said, no, 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 that's not going to work either. Be it unto you according to what you believe. And so the Bible says that the, centur that the, the centurion servant was healed the self same hour, the very same hour his servant was healed. His servant was healed. So there's, there's a, this is, this is loaded. This is loaded. And so for people who have been trekking with God, for people who are doing great big things for God, this is an issue because here it is. Jesus marveled at an outsider because the insiders weren't getting it. The insiders weren't exercising it. The insiders didn't believe. They didn't believe. They were on autopilot. They were saying, I'm blessed and highly favored. How you doing, sister? I'm blessed and highly favored. God is good. God is good all the time. And you don't mean any of it. Your, your life is in shambles behind closed doors. You ready to curse God and die, but you're really scared of going to hell. And God is saying, listen, according to what you believe, that's what you got. According to what you believe, that's what you're living. And so this word is for the insiders. This word is for the people who can speak in tongues, slap some oil. This word is for some people who can, you know, book chapter and verse. This word is for those people. God is saying, you have been praying about the same thing. Okay, it's time to go back to the drawing board. It's not, don't blame it on the timing of God anymore to make yourself feel better. Don't say that this is the will of God because now you're going against my nature. You're lying on my nature. Be it unto you according to what you believe. Be it unto you according to what you believe. Hashtag the best week ever. We gonna stop lying. This week, we gonna stop lying. We're going to stop lying in the place of intimacy. We're going to stop lying in the place of our devotion. We're going to stop lying to the people who call us on the phone. We're going to stop lying. We're going to stop lying. Let's stop the shenanigans. When Jesus turned to the man, he says, if you can believe, if you can believe, and then immediately the man said in tears, help my unbelief. That word unbelief means rejection. Help my choice to reject you. Help my choice to reject your character. Help my decision of rejecting your nature. Help my unbelief. He said it in tears. When we've gone through so much, but we've got an anointing, we act as if people feel like the anointing is going to stop and block the go-through. The anointing is going to accelerate the go-through. And so we're hiding behind all of these things, and the anointing is not your identity. The anointing belongs to the Holy Spirit. Your identity is your identity. And so all of these things that the Father has you going through, and the, pro the process, and the progress, and all of these things, and you feel like, I shouldn't, so it's a big facade, it's a big show, it's a big place, but we see you living out what you really believe about God. You feel like maybe you aren't worthy. You're getting hyped up because you can prophesy a little bit or you can pray for people a little bit and God answers him because it's not you who prays. He's answering the Holy Spirit in you that is praying his will for that person. So he's answering himself and he's saying to you, 
this broken place in our relationship, I'm ready to heal it. I'm ready to fix it. I'm ready to deal with it. But I cannot deal with it if you're lying. I cannot deal with it if you hold back. I cannot deal with it if you cover it. I cannot deal with it. I want to deal with these broken areas and I want to deal with this broken perception about me. I want to deal with this broken perception about you always feeling like you're last in line and you're the underdog and you're always looked over. I want to deal with that. And so the father says, I let that prolong in your life because this is the thing I'm dealing with. I want to bring you to the forefront. I want to bring you out front. Everything that I said concerning you, I'm going to do it in your life, but I've got to get your mind there because if you see me, if I, if I do this, if I bring you forward and your mind is still broken, you won't even realize that you're in the promise. You'll still see me as the God who allowed you to be a slave. You'll still see me as the God who only gave you manna. So you'll be standing right there in the promised land. You'll be standing right there in my precious promise, and you will still be in the place of affliction. The place under your feet can change, but if the places in your mind don't change, you haven't gone anywhere. The Father says, I want to take you somewhere before the soles of your feet touch where you're actually going. I want to take you some places with me. I want to take you on an adventure in, my, in, 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 in me and with me in the realm of the spirit before the soles of your feet actually touch that place. I want you to have already gone past that place. So you can go from region to region, but if you're stuck in your head, if you're stuck in your memories, you're not going anywhere. And so the father says, hashtag the best week ever. This is what we're dealing with this week. And this summer to remember, in this summer of identity, what are you lying about? What are you still trying to conquer from a back then, from a broken situation? How do you view God in terms of what you've come through? Are you angry? Are you bitter? How do you see yourself? How do you measure up? What are you doing in the world out here just to give yourself a piece of identity. Some people go and do and go and do because they feel like they have to make it happen. They've got to get high on something because they're really, really low in their mind. They feel like less than. They feel like I'm always going to be broken. And the father says, absolutely not. He says, I want, I want to heal that picture in your mind about where you've been and I, I want to give you insight that where you've been was really showing you where you were really going. It was really showing you where you were really going. When you look back over it, that's when you get some understanding. So the Father says, I want to take you to a place so that you can look back over from an elevated position and it's going to change everything for you. And so this place of being stuck in our prayers, this place of being stuck, you're going to be, if your mind is stuck, your prayers are going to be stuck. I don't care what comes out of your mouth. Let me grandmama you for a minute, intercessors, prophets, people who name the name of, even, even if you open the Bible and you read verbatim and you pray scriptures verbatim, if your mind is stuck, all you're doing is some incantations. If there's no belief there, if there's no belief, then you're, try, you're using this to try to make, to conjure something up. It doesn't work like that. The centurion didn't have book, chapter, and verse. He had belief. Jesus said unto him, according to your belief, not according to book, chapter, and verse. God, he, Jesus said unto him, according to your belief, not according to how long you prayed and how loud you prayed. Not what was coming out of your mouth, but what people can't see. According to what you believe, what people can't see. He said, it's going to be done. And the Bible says in that self-same hour, some things are going to change. Some things are going to be overturned and turned over when we begin to deal with this place in honesty. Or with honesty. Some things are going to happen real quickly because it's, you've been on the precipice. You've been on the pinnacle. You've been at the tipping point for a really long time. But what's holding you back is this old stuff, this belief system, this ideology of the father that oh, nobody can see. Nobody can see. Only you can deal with. I pray this is making sense. What God said to you 
You don't even have the totality of it. What God said about you, you don't even have the totality about it. What God, where God wants to bring you into, you have no idea how big the picture is. And God wants it more than you do. God wants you to get a hold of this thing more than you do because God wants to build some things. God wants to get to some people. God wants to send you some places. But he's like, we're not going anywhere until we deal with this and we deal with this for real. This for real. And so hashtag the best week ever. Father, in the name of Jesus, we just bless you for this week. We bless you, Father, for Mark chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 8. We thank you, Father, that when we brought things to you and we, we didn't understand and we were just looking for a way out, we were last ditch effort, but we didn't understand that you brought us to this place because you wanted to give us, listen, the dude who had the, the, the son, out of everybody now in his town, he now had the testimony. Nobody else got to meet that side of God. They got to see it. They got to behold it. They got to witness it, but he got it. He got to, he got to consume it. So his experience with God was so much different than their experience. And so when he was looking at them and comparing himself to them and living that life, what well, he didn't know that God had set him up so that he was going to have such a great and mighty experience that most people would not have. He had a testimony that 90% of the people around him would not have. And so the father says, you don't understand that I've given you pieces and sides of me, but you can't stay su stuck in that piece of me. The father says, I want you to have all of me. I want you to walk around in the many different dimensions that I am. I want you to know my love and receive my grace. There's two sides to every coin. And the father says that even when you go through, there's another side to that. And that's come through. That's come through and that's stand in. That's, that's come through and plant in. That's come through and live in. And so the father says, I want you to live in this place, but I need you, I need you to understand what I've really given you with the places that you've been. And so hashtag the best week ever. Father, we just thank you for this revelation. I thank you, Father, for the people who are saying, yeah, this is me. And nobody would ever know that I go through these things in the secret place. Nobody would ever know that when I'm struggling and how I'm crying behind closed doors. Nobody would ever know when they call me on the phone, when I show up to church and, and I'm, you know, minister on 10. I'm prophet on 10. Nobody knows what's going on behind closed doors and how I view myself. And so really I can't even get deliverance because nobody can see because you've covered it from everybody. And so Father, I'm saying to you this week, it's me, it's me, it's me, oh Lord. Help my unbelief. Help me make a better quality decision that I believe, not in my power, but in your power. And so I take the power of can, the word can, I take the power of can and I throw it on you. You can and you will for me. You can and you will for me. Your will is for me and you will for me. Your will is for me and you will for me because you love me. Because you love me. There's so many people who are doing great things for God, but they're broken in the place of love. Yeah, we're going to deal with it. You're broken in the place of God's love for you. And so you deal with all of these other people and you can pray it and you can experience the love through that thing. But the father is saying you have a skewed perception of love and you think love is work. And the father says that I'm bringing you through a season where you're going to understand you cannot work enough to get to get what I've already caused you to receive. You were conceived in love. Hallelujah. That's what Matthew chapter 9 of the message version says. It says that you were conceived in love. God conceived you in love. And so we're, we're out here doing great big things for God, but we are broken in the place of his love for us. We're broken in the place of receiving how he really feels about you and what he really wants to do through you and in you, but he wants to do with you. He wants to do with you relationship relationship. And so Father, we just thank you for the brokenness. We thank you that this is exactly right where you want us. We bless you, God, that you're not going to allow us to uh, continue in dysfunction, functioning drunks, functioning addicts. It looks real good on the outside. We're functioning on the outside, but on the inside, we're broken. We're in a million pieces. And honestly, we're in rejection and we are in rebellion. We don't want to be on the outside. We want to be on the inside. 
And so, Father, we just bless you. We bless you, God, that you think so much of us. We bless you, Father, that you allow us not to skip over what we need to go through. You cause us not to skip over uh, what you want us to grow into, not to skip over the process because it's the process that you get real progress. Just because you're moving, you could be going around the mountain. It doesn't mean you're making progress. And so, Father, thank you that you are breaking the cycle of going around the same mountain. You're breaking the cycle of going in circles so that we can really get progress. And so we sit ourselves this week in the process. And so, Father, I thank you that people will sit before you this week, people who usually have so many prayers and tons of words when they go to pray, and they won't have anything to say this week, but they will sit before you, and, Father, you will do the work, the work of love. You will do the work, the work of identity. You will do the work this week in the name of Jesus. And so, Father, we thank you that this is a mature word because this is the people say that we're tired. We're tired of dealing with the same stuff. We're tired of, of dealing with the same stuff, and we've got to get traction. And so, God, it's not you, it's us. It's us. And so, God, for every person on here who's saying, listen, you really don't know what I've gone through, and I really feel like I've forgiven people, and I've forgiven myself, and I've forgiven God. You know, it's not about, sometimes it's not about forgiveness. Sometimes it's about the view and the perception of where that place left you. What that place left you. Where it left you. And so you've forgiven the people. You've forgiven the, yourself. You've forgiven the Father for going through that place. But where did it leave you? Where did it leave your mind about you? Where did it leave your mind about God? And so if you don't feel right unless you're going through, you don't feel right unless you're getting hated on, you don't feel right unless people are dropping you off and leaving you for dead, you don't feel like you're dead, then God is saying, no, that's skewed, that's warped. God says that I, I created people to love you. He says, I've created people to walk with you. I've created people to sow into you the same thing that you're doing. The Father says, I've given the people that will do it to you, but you cannot receive it because it's warped. And the Father says, I want to fix that. The Father says, I want you to become authentic. The Father says, I want to heal you in those places that you would never reveal to people. The Father says, I want you to take those cardboard boxes out of your closet and throw them away. Never to bring another one inside of our house, our El Bethel. That was then. This is now. And we will not bring Egypt into a place that flows with milk and honey. Egypt served something, but now it's over. And so, Father, we thank you that this testimony is for us, and this testimony will come from us. And we love you, and we honor you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 I love you guys. I challenge you to go back and to read these, Mark chapter 9 and Matthew chapter 8, very, very slowly. And to see where God has been challenging you about your can and what you believe. And to submit this before him and ask him to show you every place in your life where there is unbelief. Because honestly, 80% of us are dealing with some unbelief in some places and it's holding the whole ship up. It's an anchor. Unbelief is an anchor where we can't go forward without resistance. Because it's double-minded. It's double-mindedness. Amen. And then I, I challenge you to call, to call three people and to challenge them and to pray for them for the places of their unbelief. Or when you call somebody and you say, how are you doing? And they say, blessed and highly favored for you to say to them again, no, seriously, how are you doing? Because I want to pray with you and I want to pray for you because I, I don't want you to have to fake it till you make it. And then challenge them to do the same thing. We gotta stop faking it till we make it. We don't have to. We don't have to do that. You don't have to do that. So call, and when they say, how, when you say, how are you doing, really mean it. And when they answer, you stop them and ask them again and say, listen, I wanna know the truth. How are you doing? How are you doing? The church is not just the four walls, you are the church. Healing is in your salutation. Healing is in your greeting. Healing is in your conversation. Be authentic. Amen? Amen. So tomorrow we'll be on Periscope. On Wednesday we will be in the prayer wall at 6 a.m. Again, we have somebody special who's going to pray. 
but tomorrow we'll be on Periscope at 6 a.m. for prayer. Um, I pray that you go back over this. It's the best week ever. It's your best life ever. Such a great time to be you. This too shall pass. All right? Love you guys. Good night.